Hello YouTubers, Alaska Prepper here. Well, I decided to cover a subject today that at first I didn't want to do a video about this because so many people have heard about this, but I thought that it would be a disservice to not cover it because there may be some people out there that are not aware of this. So I am going to go ahead and cover this subject. And before I tell you what it is, I just want to say that any of you that know what I'm going to be talking about, once I start talking about it, if you would stay on and maybe make some comments and suggestions for those that maybe don't know about this and are hearing about this for the first time, it would probably help a great deal. Uh, I would like to start a conversation about this so that we can help those that don't understand what this may be or what can really happen or how it happens so that maybe those of you that have more knowledge about this subject matter can help out in the comments and allow people to become aware of this. So having said that, uh, if you have someone that you care about, do try to share this video or at least provide them the links that I'm going to provide you. I'm going to be going over three articles today that pretty much tell you about coronal mass ejections. Okay, I'm not going to give you the definition of what it is as I know it. I'm going to read it from the article because these articles were written by people that actually know a lot more about this than I do. All I do know is that coronal mass ejections are real. They've happened in the past. They actually happen quite often. However, depending on which side of the sun they're ejected from is depends on whether it hits the earth or not. But these articles that I'm going to cover pretty much let you know when it's happened, what can occur after it's happened, and all of the nitty-gritty and then if we can maybe have a conversation on the comments that would be great because like I said at first I wasn't going to cover it because I've seen a lot of YouTube videos about this and I'm pretty well informed about what a coronal mass ejection is but I wanted to make sure that our community that everyone in our community community uh, is informed as well and if you're not and you're hearing this for the first time don't let this be the only video that you listen to or watch concerning this subject matter because I feel that this is very important uh, if we have a massive coronal mass ejection that hits the earth it can literally mean billions of lives lost worldwide okay so I'm gonna go ahead and start it off and just to let you all know uh, a lot of people confuse EMPs with coronal mass ejections. Okay, a coronal mass ejection is um, derived from the sun. Okay, an EMP is man-made or natural. However, the natural part comes from things like lightning and such. Okay, the man-made part comes from either man creating machines that can produce an EMP at a small scale or man using nuclear warheads to produce an EMP that will go throughout our atmosphere but today I'm going to be talking specifically about coronal mass ejections because a coronal mass ejection in my opinion is not a matter of if it can happen it's a matter of when it will happen it's happened before several times to the earth and it's certain to happen again okay so here I go let's go ahead and start and uh, start reading this article okay so the article was posted on the 1st of May 2014 however the science really hasn't changed a coronal mass ejection has been a CME forever okay so here we go the planet's source of life can also devastate modern society the greatest threat to Earth sits right at the heart of our solar system. The warm, life-giving nuclear factory we call the Sun 
is essential to all life as we know it. Yet it is millions of times more violent and destructive than any other force our planet faces. This is the same sun that eradicated the atmosphere on Mars some four billion years ago when the planet lost its magnetic field. Remember this? <laughs> and then he was being sarcastic there. Earth sits much closer to the sun than Mars does and thus more intensely and thus and is thus more intensely subjected to the sun's formidable power. Not only does the sun generate temperatures on its surface upward of 10 million degrees Fahrenheit or 5,538 degrees Celsius, but its core temperature is over 27 million degrees Fahrenheit or 15 million degrees Celsius. It is at the center of the sun where its fuel, hydrogen, fuses to create helium in a nuclear fusion process like plutonium atom like the plutonium atomic bomb that was used at the end of World War II and is the ultimate source of its fierce energy in the form of light, heat, and other radiation. This process is why life thrives on our planet, but it is also why life is impossible on other on others and consistently poses dangers to Earth itself. The Goldilocks zone, all right, the Goldilocks, the zone of life. The key to life on Earth is that it is in the Goldilocks zone, as many scientists like to call it. It is not too close to the sun and it is not too far away. Its average distance from the sun, just under 93 million miles, is just right for Earth to create optimum conditions for life. While the sun consistently blankets Earth with, with its warmth energy, it also emits harmful radiation. Most of the harmful rays are in the form of ultraviolet radiation. This is what causes sunburns. But they also include x-rays and extremely dangerous gamma radiation. While some of these rays actually make it to Earth's surface, Earth's atmosphere, including its magnetosphere, serves to absorb and shield most of these harmful rays from life and above the surface while also retaining life-sustaining levels of warmth and energy. These normal processes and relationships have evolved and existed since Earth formed about 4.5 million years ago. But with the sun's constant stream of heat and energy comes an overwhelming phenomenon so powerful that it can totally wipe out all possibility of life on Earth as it did on Mars. And it would wear it not in and it would were it not for the Earth's magnetic field, which shields the planet's surface from these massive solar occurrences. The power of a billion hydrogen bombs. Coronal mass ejections or CMEs are violent ejections of solar gas, plasma and electromagnetic radiation that can propel more than 10 billion tons of solar matter outward from the sun's atmosphere with the power of over a billion hydrogen bombs. And it, spe uh, it specifies the sources where it got this information. They can extend billions of miles into space. Once jettisoned from the sun's hold, they can accelerate to several million miles per hour and can reach Earth within one to three days. And here is a scale of the Earth to the Sun. And this right here, if you're following my little pointer, this right here is a coronal mass ejection. And you can see how much bigger than the Sun, it, than the Earth, it actually is. So it is huge. And then it says here, ladies and gentlemen, that this right here, this CME, can accelerate to several million miles per hour. The good news is, is that it takes one to three days for it to reach the Earth. So if someone's watching this, they can actually alert the public. I'm not sure if a governmental organization would alert the public if they knew this was happening, but there's a lot of other scientists out there that are always watching this, and maybe they would. I know that Diamond from the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, I know that he watches this all the time. So 
If you guys aren't subscribed to the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, I highly recommend that you guys go on there. Uh, I was actually listening to one of his podcasts a couple a day or two ago on CMEs, and that's what encouraged me to bring it up in this channel because, like I said, you can look for YouTube videos all over YouTube that cover this this uh, subject matter, but I just wanted to make sure that I put it out there so that if someone hasn't heard about this, that you can actually go ahead and research it yourself so that you can know exactly what it's about. I'm just trying to give you a taste of what this is. That way you can go ahead and do your own research because I feel this is very important. This is a lot more dangerous than an economic collapse or SHTF. All right, this is a life-ending event that can actually, and it's not a life-ending event because it's going to wipe the earth out of space. All right, if that happened, we'd have no choice. But it's a life-ending event because nowadays our lives revolve around technology. All right, everything we do is centered around an electric grid. If we did not have electricity, we would not be able to live the way we do now. And we would not be able to, and the planet would not be able to sustain life at the number of people that live in it the way that it does now with the technology we have and especially with having electricity. All right, so electricity is something that we take for granted. And this is something that can take all of that away. All right, now, okay, moving on. The more powerful CMEs travel much faster and are the most destructive. They can also be millions of times larger than the Earth itself. When a massive CME reaches the distance of Earth's orbit around the Sun, they can be well over 45 million miles in diameter, about half the distance between Earth and the Sun, and nearly 6,000 times larger than Earth's diameter. CMEs are huge events, says Dr. Jeffrey Newark, or sorry, Newmark solar physicist, scientist in NASA's uh, heliophysics division. They have been hitting Earth since it formed, and it will continue to hit our planet. Every, every few weeks, a CME hits our planet, but they have been small and have relatively little impact. And the reason they have relatively little impact is because of their size and because the Earth has that magnetic field that protects it against radiation and all of those particles that come from the sun. It is the immense coronal mass ejection that hits Earth head-on that would spell major trouble for modern society's way of life. Even today, the smaller CME events shut down satellites and global communication systems, as well as interrupt airline control and electric power grids. A massive CME that hits, that, that hits Earth directly would be exponentially more dangerous. Most CMEs rocket harmlessly through space. However, about 30 of them hit Earth every year, with most of them skimming off the planet's atmosphere. A direct hit from a very large CME is a one in a 100 year event, according to solar research at NASA and the European Space Agency. Okay, low probability, but possible at any time. The probability of a massive CME directly hitting Earth is pretty low, but it still could happen at any time, says Dr. Newark. Newmark, sorry. But if but if and when a CME hits Earth head on, he says, the results could be catastrophic to modern human society. The frequency of CMEs vary according to the solar activity cycles, which have an average duration of about 11 years. At the height of each cycle, two to three CMEs are generated per day, whereas at the low end of the cycle, there is an occurrence about one per week. Right now, we are at about the peak of the solar cycle, said Dr. Newmark, but the frequency of CMEs does not mean one cannot hit Earth directly at any time. Not only could the cost of such a direct hit by a massive CME be ranged into the trillions of dollars, but it would set back the progress of society many years. 
the entire technology infrastructure on which human life has become totally dependent from electricity and power generation to communications, business transactions, healthcare, commerce, agriculture, and other critical infrastructures of modern society would be decimated and take many years to recover. General electricity throughout the world would all of a sudden be widely wiped out and would take years to restore. Now think about that, ladies and gentlemen. What would happen if we lost electricity, not a region or not a country, but if the entire world lost electricity for a whole year or for years? Think about that. It could easily shut down the Industrial Revolution, says Ecologies.com weather ecology specialist Frank Billingsley, who is also a chief meteor meteorologist at KPRC TV2 in Houston, Texas. If so much of our technology and electrical systems, along with the plants that supply them, are shut down, then we are going to go back to the time of the Industrial to to the time of the Industrial Revolution, a CME setback in today's technology society, technological society to the scale of the early years of the Industrial Revolution might put us toward a solar revolution, Billingsley added. We may have to depend much more heavily on solar and wind energy as an extreme coronal mass ejection could knock out our, immediately, our immediate dependence on fossil fuels. Our primary source for power and electricity, whereas if we depend on the sun primarily and a CME hits, the relevant technology could likely just let us go back to using solar energy the next day. Just knowing that such an occurrence is possible and certainly probable at some point in the future should make society rethink how to best prepare for an advent of a massive CME by looking even more seriously at the use of solar and other renewable energy at, at the personal and industrial level, according to Billingsley. It is easier said than done, but also quite possible in a certain path to the future. Though the probability may be low that a massive human life altering CME will heat Earth directly, it has happened in the past as well as there have been numerous near misses. While the sun consistently radiates its elect electrically charged solar wind in all directions, CMEs are single creations of solar activity that are jettisoned out in one direction. From that perspective, Earth is but a small dot in a massive universe millions of miles away, so the chance of a CME would head precisely in Earth's direction is mathematically low. The downside to that is the sun generates a lot of them and sometimes they are massive and they connect. Solar Supreme Storm of 1859 On September 2nd of 1859, the largest solar storm ever recorded propelled an intensely powerful CME directly at Earth. The CME from the solar storm of 1859, also referred to as the solar storm of 1859, that makes no sense, I think he might, have, he might have meant also referred to as the Carrington event, created perhaps the most prolific auroras, natural atmospheric lights generated by the interaction between Earth's magnetic field and the electromagnetically charged radiation from the sun, in other, in other words, the northern lights seen on the planet extending from both the north magnetic pole as far south as Cuba and some of the magnetic pole of Cuba and the South Magnetic Pole as far north as Queensland, Australia. Look at that aurora. That is beautiful, isn't it? But it also knocked out the leading technology of the day throughout all of North America and Europe. The global telegraph system. The CME was so strong it literally gave telegraph operators shocks, electric shocks, and created auroras more brilliant than the moon. Fortunately, technology was not nearly as advanced and essential to human life then as it has become today. The Industrial Revolution had only begun to take root in human society that would eventually pave the way for today's high developed technological dependent society. In fact, the first electricity produced producing utility companies would not be established 
until nearly two decades later. All right, recent near misses, or a recent near miss. In more recent history, on July 23rd of 2012, the sun hurled a rapid succession of coronal mass ejections directly through Earth's orbit. According to scientist, scientist Dr. Ying Di Liu of China's State Key Laboratory of Space Weather and Research Physicist Janet G. Lumen of the University of California, this CME would have made a direct impact on, on Earth and the CME arrived nine days earlier. The CME was so powerful that it reached Earth's orbit in 19 hours. Should a CME of this magnitude of the one that erupted from the solar storm of 1859 or the near miss CME on July 23, 2012 hit the Earth today, modern civilization would severely be disrupted. The technologies that essentially support and enable human life today would be fried by the immense solar force. Overwhelmingly, the Earth's protective magnetic field, or sorry, overwhelming the Earth's protective magnetic field. Earth's shield against CMEs. It is Earth's magnetic field that forms a protective cocoon called the mag magnetosphere that shields the planet from these high energy particles. CMEs do not post any direct threats to humans or our ecology. Rather, their impacts can be felt in our high technology, says Dr. Newmark. Although the planet's magnetic field protects Earth from harmful radiation, it is not strong enough to ward off the full intense electromagnetic impact of a massive CME. The magnetic field would continue to work which is why you would see the brilliant northern and southern auroras, like those that appeared during the 19, 18, 1859 solar storm. About the same amount of solar energy would hit the planet as it did then. The difference is that today there is an extraordinarily advanced level of human technology and innovation that would be exposed and highly vulnerable to the power of a massive CME. Earth generates its own shield with its magnetic field, says Dr. Kuang, a geologist and applied mathematician for NASA. When solar winds come to Earth, they will be deflected because of the magnetic field, causing the charged particles to move away from Earth. The magnetic field is the planet's primary shielding, not only from solar wind and CME activity, but harmful cosmic rays and similar activity from interstellar sources as well. But the strength of the Earth's magnetic field is relatively weak in general. Compared to a strong, common refrigerator magnet, the Earth's magnetic field will range from about 25 to 65 percent of the strength of the magnet. Wow. Stronger at the poles and weaker in between the poles. Still, the magnetic field is currently strong enough to shield Earth from the regular occurrences of solar and related interstellar electromagnetic radiation. But Earth's magnetic field is currently weakening, according to Dr. Kuang. The magnetic field can only be protected, sorry, the magnetic field can only protect the Earth but so much, he said. But he explains that the magnetic field has been weaken, weakening for about the last hundred years or so, indicating that a reversal of the magnetic poles may currently be in the making. It is during this time that the field is at its weakest point. When the last complete reversal took place before the development of human society, scientists have determined Earth's magnetic field dropped to 5% of its current strength. Wow. The weakening of the field is a natural process, according to Dr. Kwan, stating that the Earth's magnetic poles typically take about 200 to 300,000 years to reverse or flip with each other, although it has been twice that long since the last reversal. If the field continues to weaken, in time we will see more and more disturbances or events that could be harmful to human activity, somewhere between disaster and disturbances. The weaker the field, the closer the shield gets to us, and thus the more that electrical particles can get to us. We can get prepared. The earth will be fine. Sure, the earth is going to be fine, ladies and gentlemen. It's just what's going to happen to the inhabitants of the earth. Carrying on. 
The bottom line is this. Earth's surface and life will generally not be directly affected by a massive CME. But the technology on which today's modern civilization is absolutely dependent could be devastated if one were to hit Earth head on, especially if the magnetic field is in a weak state. But we can get prepared for what happens, Dr. Kwan concludes. Just like an earthquake, we cannot create them, but if we know when and where they will occur, we can take preventive action to reduce or eliminate damages and loss. NASA's Dr. Newmark sums it up in a very plain term. Earth has been around for 4.5 billion years. CMEs have been hitting Earth for 4.5 billion years. It's pretty safe to say the Earth itself will not care much, but humankind will care. The difference is in the technological infrastructure that dominates and sustains human life today. That same innovation and should, sorry, that same innovation can and should be used to protect mankind's technological society with the understanding of our exposure to the sun's most powerful threatening hold over our planet. Maybe long odds, and maybe not, but very real. And here are some, you know, facts. Did you know the energy of one CME could power human society for 2 million years? Wow. The Earth intercepts about 70 coronal mass ejections per year when solar activity is at its peak, and less than 10 will have the punch needed to produce large geomagnetic storms. The sun still has 99.9% .9 of its energy left, burning hydrogen to create helium. So far, 1,709 planets have been confirmed to exist outside our solar system, orbiting other stars. Wow, that's pretty cool. Of those, less than two dozen could support life like Earth, but this is not known. There are, in, there are indications that another 2,903 planets exist, mostly found through the Kepler Space Observatory, but away confirmation through other sources. All right, so that's this uh, article, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm going to leave the link to this article. But this article right here is pretty much letting you guys know what a CME is, you know, how long it would take to get here, you know, how the sun protects itself. I'm sorry, how the Earth protects itself from CMEs, you know, and look at the size of that coronal mass ejection. It is huge. Look at that again, the Earth. It is huge. And this is something that I encourage everyone to research. Let's go ahead and spend a couple of minutes on a different article. Okay, I'm not going to make this very long. Okay, so here is another article. And this is from a prepper's perspective, okay? And I'll try to get through this one pretty quick. As preppers, we tend to focus more on disaster and scenarios that are more down to earth, but preparing for a CME and the after effects could turn into something down to earth. As we were watching Doomsday, 10 Ways the World Will End on History Channel, some of these disasters from outer space are a little far-fetched for even my paranoid brain to handle. However, CMEs happen more often than you think, but most of the time we are not in the path of this plasma ejection. A little over 150 years ago, we were in the path of a CME named Carrington event in 1859, which the other article uh, talked about this, but they didn't name it the Carrington event, which is also called the Carrington event. Right? In 1989, a small, and I remember this too, because uh, I graduated college, on, I mean, I graduated high school this year, I remember this. In 1989, a small-scale CME blacked out Quebec. In 2012, there was an enormous CME, but that one just missed us by about two weeks. What would a Carrington-scale event look like now? How would our electric grid and society in general handle an event like this? The answer is unknown and depends on the magnitude, magnitude of the CME. What we do know is that most societies cannot function without electricity. Everything we do revolves around electricity in one way or another, from our banking system to our water supply to the way we get our food. Just think about it, ladies and gentlemen. If you make a list of everything that you do in your life that depends on electricity, 
All right, make a list of everything you do in your life that depends on electricity, and you'll be amazed at how dependent we are on the electrical grid. The White House recently put out an executive order about coordinating efforts to prepare the nation for space weather events. Here is an excerpt of that. Government warning, extreme space weather events, those that could significantly degrade critical infrastructure, could disable large portions of the electrical power grid, resulting in cascading failures that would affect key services such as water supply, health care, and transportation. Space weather has the potential to simultaneously affect and disrupt health and safety across the entire continent, across entire continents. Successfully preparing for space weather events is an all-of-nation endeavor that requires partnerships across governments, emergency managers, academia, the media, the insurance industry, nonprofits, and the private sector. It is the policy of the United States to prepare for space weather events to minimize the extent of economic loss and human hardship. But yeah, they haven't done anything about it. I remember reading somewhere that it would only cost a few billion dollars to harden our electrical grid here in the U.S. against EMPs and or CMEs and that they won't put it in the budget. So they'd rather take us to war and spend trillions of dollars killing other people than to do something that is productive and could actually help us. But that's my opinion. Basically, it's a blob of the sun getting burst into space in the direction of the Earth. For a more specific expl explanation, look at this article here. You guys can click on this article uh, if you guys go to the link that I leave you. How long would it take for a CME to reach the Earth? And would we be able to prepare? CMEs typically reach Earth one to five days after leaving the sun. Uh, I, would I would assume that the government or NASA will let us know that this was about to happen because you would think it's in their best interest to keep the children happy. But it wouldn't be, but I wouldn't be shocked if the opposite were true. Yep. Even if we do get warning and have a few days to prepare, I'm not sure that there is a lot that can be done on a large scale. As individuals, we would be able to protect some of our personal electronics by using Faraday cages and shielding them. But the electric grid would still be going down, and we wouldn't be able to, and we wouldn't be able to power them. Okay. What initial damage could a CME do? Okay, so transformers will be toast as well, and they take two years to produce. This is especially important because, and we have no backups. Okay, this is especially important. We have no backups and are only, and they are only produced in Germany and South Korea. This means the grid could be down for a very long time. So let's say, for example, something like this happens and affects the whole world. Do you think that South Korea and Germany would uh, make the transformers for their countries before ours? Because we don't produce them here. I think they'd probably be making it for themselves before they make them for us. The fuel rods that power the world's 400 nuclear reactors must be kept cool 24 hours a day. These are kept cool by water. Water pumped in by electricity. These plants have emergency generators that will last about 72 hours and then battery system that will last about a week. Cars might become damaged, but contrary to popular belief, it is hard to say if automobiles would be completely useless, although getting fuel for them might be impossible. Planes probably won't just fall from the sky, but runway lights and GPS would be gone. Critical infrastructure would be affected. Losing electrical grid could be more deadly than nuclear war. And if any of you that are familiar with CMEs and EMPs, you all know that uh, it's estimated that if we had a total grid failure where we didn't have electricity for a full year, that they estimate that only 1 in 10 people would survive the first year. So that's 10% that would survive the first year. The modern food system is completely dependent on electricity, from growing to harvesting to transporting to refrigerating. Supermarkets will become battlegrounds. We all probably know this, but going to the grocery, grocery store could be a life and death situation. Cash on hand is just the first problem. The entire banking system is electronic and it could either be, it, it could either be gone or inaccessible. 
No electric pumps, no running water, no gasoline, and no sewage. Disease and sickness could become rampant because of a lack of sanitation. There will be fires from short circuits from anything electrical. On a small scale, this could be our toasters. On a large scale, this could be disastrous. The short-term effects. A total collapse of civilization, it will literally be every man and woman for themselves. People will be fighting for resources. Martial law will be enacted and most of the population will die off. The show talks about how people will head out into the woods hunting and how most people have never been hunting in their lives. This will cause many problems, not to mention the hunter-gatherer lifestyle is not sustainable for 320 million people. So it's said that in the United States of America, there's about 30 million deer. So for people that say, yeah, we'll just hunt, you know, we'll just go and hunt deer. Well, there's maybe one deer for every 10 or so people in the U.S. So they will be dwindled down pretty quickly. After a couple of weeks, we will basically be, after a couple of weeks, we will basically start evolving into a tribal state. This would literally be a Mad Max Walking Dead scenario. After about six weeks, people would be drinking from polluted water sources because they had no choice. Human waste, hospital waste, industrial waste, back flowing into lakes and rivers. And do you guys think that the garbage men are going to be working if something like this happens, ladies and gentlemen? So if you guys want, ask Buzz what would happen if garbage collection halted for only one week or for a month. Extreme heat and extreme cold will kill people as well. The show estimates that the world's population will be reduced from 7 billion to 2 billion in a little over a month. That means two out of every three people will die because of our dependence on electricity. The aftermath. In just one year, there will be less than 1 billion people still alive across the planet. And that might be a generous guess. Most of us think about what we would do immediately following some sort of SHTF event and for food re and for good reasons we need to be able to survive a year to be able to rebuild afterwards one year after this large CME the remaining people will have fought off bandits protected their resources and been through more in one year than they have in their entire life most of the danger would be gone at this point for most for the most part because the only people who survive will be the ones who knew how to survive, alternative energy, gardening, etc. Group communities and small-scale infrastructure would, would form as people started to rebuild. At this point, all is not lost. It's just an uphill battle. We have the knowledge, but we just won't have the resources to do anything on a large scale. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the second one. This one's a little more, you know, this one's a little more to the point, okay, of how important it is for us to be prepared as far as having food, water, self-defense, okay? In a case like this, forget about the fourth B of prepping, all right? Because in a case like this, uh, you know, precious metals or wealth preservation is not going to do anything for you. That's why I say that if you're thinking about getting precious metals to preserve your wealth, that's a good idea, but you have to make sure that before you, you know, you you uh, take on that endeavor to go and get precious metals, you have to have your first three B's of prepping. Your first three B's of prepping are more important than getting precious metals. Okay, so let's cover this last one here real quick. This one's not very, very long, and I'm just gonna read a little excerpt from this one. It's hard to fathom the social consequences of billions of power-hungry humans suddenly being pulled off the grid. But I think we can all agree it wouldn't be pretty. What we know for sure is that the economic toll would be enormous. The National Academics Report estimates that total cost of a carrington size event today could exceed $2 trillion, 20 times greater than, that, than the cost of Hurricane Katrina. It's important to keep in mind that we aren't take, talking about some incredibly far-fetched Armageddon-style apocalypse situation here. In fact, in July of 2012, a massive CME ripped through the Earth's orbit and narrowly missed us. And we talked about this in the other article as well. That event, which was picked up by NASA's Stereo A satellite, 
would have registered at a DST of 1200 NT, comparable to the Carrington event. So that CME that just missed us here a few years ago was about the same size as the one that created the Carrington event. If it had hit, we would still be picking up the pieces. Space weather scientist Daniel Baker of the University of Colorado told NASA in 2014, how many other storms of this scale have just happened to miss Earth and our space detection systems and our space detection systems? This is a pressing question that needs answers. So I'm not going to read the rest of this because I've read enough already. And if you guys want to come and take a look at these articles, uh, please feel free to do so. So ladies and gentlemen, this year, this year episode in the Alaska Prepper is not fear porn. All right. I'm not here to try to scare anyone. I'm here to try to empower you with not even information, but with ideas so that you can go and do your own research. And as you can see here, this is how the Earth's magnetic field works. Um, as it's being blasted by the sun. So I don't want to scare anyone. I just want you to be informed so that you can decide whether whether a subject matter that I cover is worthy of you doing your own research. And, and, and having said that, I do want to encourage you to research this because I think that it would encourage you to prep even more. All right, because that's what prepping is about, is to be ready. All right, is so that you can be empowered. If you can tell yourself, yep, I have enough preps that will get me through a year. You know, I have enough fuel stored up for a year. I have enough wood for my wood stove for a year. I have enough food for a year. I have a way of protecting myself and my family. I have neighbors and I have a community that is willing to work together so that we can get through things that can happen, whatever it may be. If you can start thinking like that, you know, and just take it one step at a time. If something of, like this were ever to happen, it wouldn't be easy, but you would have more of a better chance than someone who is not prepared to make it through to the other side. And then when you make it through to the other side, then that's when those precious metals come in handy. <laughs> so it's not about money and it's not really about wealth when something like this happens. It's about survival. And I hope that you all uh, do a little bit of research. I hope that those of you that know about this and that have actually done a little bit of research in this, in, you know, in, uh, on this subject before, leave your comments. Any of you that may have questions, you know, leave questions and the community will answer it and we'll help each other out. There's several things that we can do to protect some of our electronics, you know, like Faraday cages and, uh, you know, unplugging them. Uh, I read an article today that said that you should get a surge protector. And believe me, from what I've read, a surge protector is not going to help any uh, electronics that you have if it's plugged in uh, uh, from a CME. Okay? So, like I said, do your research, ladies and gentlemen. This is a subject matter that is worthy of looking into. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Uh, so, because I just wanted to bring this up to your guys' attention so you can look into it. So, having said that, remember to be good to each other. When good people do good things, good things happen. And remember to reach one, teach one, and repeat. If we all did this, the world would be a better place, and you know that it will be a better place. Many blessings to all of you and your families. I hope that you have a great week. And if I don't talk to you, to you again before this Wednesday, those of you that live in, live in the United States... Uh, I hope that you have a great 4th of July. Have a good time with your families and remember what the what the holiday is about. I do believe that Canada has a holiday uh, today on the 2nd. Uh, so to you Canadians out there, happy holidays to you as well. Uh, many blessings to all of you. This is Alaska Prepper and I'm out.